Um, what? Yeah. Teresa. Hi, how's the lighting? Good. You look good. Okay, and then can does this <laughs> look like I'm looking at the camera? I don't know. I have to like look at my keys. Does that look like it? Yeah, you're, yeah it's pretty close. I mean, like if I if you tell me that you're reading your slides, then I would I would pay attention to that, but otherwise I would not notice. Well, because I realize it's hard to like look at my slides and the camera. I know. <laughs> It's like you got to be, I don't know, multitasking. Yeah. I've got two computers going right now. Okay, so it doesn't look like that bad right now. No, no, it looks good. Okay. Wait, I'm going to get some water. And there's people, I'll, I'll wait on the waiting room until like we're closer, just in case you want to pull up your slides or anything. Oh, yeah, I guess I should try doing that. Let's see. Should I screen share first and then present? Probably, I think that's the way to do it. Yeah, I think so. Where is screen share? Oh boy. <laughs> and then I click screen this one, share. Is that working? I see presenter mode. Okay. Is that working? That's perfect. Okay. Then I need to move this baby. Okay. Does that look like I'm looking at the camera? Kind of. No. No. Now? Yeah, you look like you're looking at the camera. Okay. What about? <laughs> it's annoying because my Zoom screen, if I want to see what myself looks like, I have to look to the left because my the Zoom. Oh yeah, and then you're like you're only halfway in this the the picture now. Uh. You might have to move the camera. And now it's too down. I need like a booster seat. <laughs> How's that? That looks good. Ideal. Which way should it go? Is that better? That looks good. That's perfect. I see how you can only see my head. Hey. <laughs> oh, ring light. Oh, come on. <laughs> Get on my level, Bryce. That's so sick. Did you join it? Yeah. Okay. Um, what are you doing for? Are you doing presenter mode? Oh, you got two screens. You're yeah. Smart. You I'm can do Susan's office if you do one of two screens. Yeah. Tell, tell Bryce to go to my office. He can do that. Uh, if you want two screens, I can, I can share part of my screen, which I've been doing. What does that mean? Like you can only share oh. that one part. Oh, that's cool. But it's a little bit like the. Uh, that's so sick. The, uh, the quality is quite as good. Yeah, it's, well, it's this really light cool. is out, which is like, this is key. Killer. Yeah. Okay. But now I look, do I look too bright? Good. No, you look good. As a backup. Are you guys on the Zoom meeting right now? Yeah, and you can, well, if you want to email me. Tell them I just let them in. We just let, oh, you, you, in. let you in. If you want to email me your slides, you can pull it up. I can pull it up here. Just as a triple back. Right. <laughs>
Ms. Susan, can you hear me? I can. Cool. Let me see if we can get this thing going. How I want it to work. Your video is not on, but you probably know that. <laughs> All right, perfect. There we um, go. Video looks okay. Not as good as not as good as Reese's. Well, I mean, you're just not going to look as good as Reese. I mean, there's that. That's true. That's also yeah. There's nothing oh, I can say about that though. You cannot start sharing screen while other participant is sharing. Oh, she's got to stop sharing. I'm going to make her stop. Okay, make her stop. Uh, stop participant. Okay. Oh wow. Share screen. All right. Can looks you perfect. see? It, it does look like perfect. I mean, it, look, it looks perfect. It looks good. Awesome. So you can only see that stuff. And then okay. I can see none of your thoughts. Cool. So it works. Yes. Does it look crappy quality or it's okay? No, it looks good. Sweet. I mean, if you told me it looked more granular than recess, I'd go, oh, yeah, okay. Now I see, but I wouldn't notice otherwise. Sure. All right. That's all I need to hear. All right, good. <clears throat> Prices first. Wait, who's first? Yeah, I'm asking. Oh, I think Reese is first. Okay. I didn't. Reese, I'm going to stop your video for the moment. Stop my video? Yeah, for the moment. I just turned your camera off right now. So, so nobody will see you come sliding back in. Okay, I should probably mute mine then too, huh? I can do that.
All right, good morning, everyone. I uh, hope everyone is doing well this morning. We are looking forward to grand rounds this morning from a couple, we have a couple of resident presentations. Uh, we do not have any uh, meetings or journal clubs or anything to follow today. And just as a reminder, we are scheduled to also do grand rounds next week virtually. Um, over the next you know, week to 10 days, we'll be sort of assessing um, uh, safety issues and health issues. And um, I'd like to get back to our, uh, at least our hybrid model back at uh, Mercy in February, but we'll uh, send out an official announcement about that. Our CME color for this morning will be uh, white in honor of uh, what seems to be snow week. Uh, I know we have another uh, potential storm coming here at the end of the week. Um, hopefully uh, it won't impact our daily care very much. Um, I know I'm on trauma call Saturday and I've got a four wheel drive car, so it should be good, uh, at least with one person showing up. Um, but without uh, further ado, I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Reed to uh, go ahead and share a screen. And we will uh, look forward to hearing about the uh, orthopedic stethoscope. All right, thanks, Dr. Pat. Um, so I'm Risa Reed, I'm one of the current chiefs, and today I will be talking about the use of ultrasound in orthopedics. I do not have any financial disclosures. Um, so before we start, I'd like to think about a couple cases. So our first one is a 36-year-old former athlete who's playing some pickup basketball, um, tried to block a shot and heard a pop, um, and then had immediate pain to his ankle. The second case is a six-year-old uh, patient who recently moved to Charlotte, was doing some heavy lifting with boxes, and started having shoulder pain afterwards. And he does have a history of a pacemaker. And our last one was a 16-year-old baseball player who started having medial elbow pain um, after a game of pitching. So there's a growing interest of ultrasound technologies over time. Um, and this is represented by the amount of uh, publications that have been done specifically with regards to ultrasound education over the past several years. So as with everything, if we look back far enough, we can trace it back to the Greeks, starting with Pythagoras and later Bothius, who both were studying sound waves, Bothius by dropping pebbles of water into a calm uh, stream. But it wasn't really until the 18th century uh, when physicists started analyzing basically how bats were able to navigate and fly through the dark, deducing that they actually employed sound rather than light to orient themselves. So this formed the basis of ultrasound, uh, ultrasound physics, which didn't really take off until 1877, when the theory of physoelectricity was discovered, which is basically the ability of a crystal to produce an electricity in the form of vibrations produced by the ultrasound wave. However, ultrasound really didn't take off until uh, 1950, 1915, specifically after the sinking of the Titanic, when scientific efforts were rallied to develop a system to basically be able to visualize underwater structures. Later on in World War, II, World War I, the French government actually commissioned research to kind of use these high frequency sound waves to find German submarines. And then that with the basing of this data, we developed the US, uh, the US Navy system was actually able to develop sonar technology. It really wasn't until 1942, however, when ultrasound was first used for medical diagnoses. And over the late 40s and 50s, we start to see ultrasound being used in medicine, the first echocardiogram, the introduction of ultrasound into ob -GYN. Throughout the 60s, 70s, and 80s, we start to see the evolution of sonography, the technology is becoming more sophisticated, improving the quality with 3D imaging capability. And we start to see how it became a kind of from a field of a couple pioneers to basically an entire profession, with these devices becoming smaller, more portable, and more user-friendly. So all forms of ultrasound basically revolve around generating acoustic energy. So this piezoelectric effect having the crystal within the transducer, producing an acoustic pressure wave, that's then transmitted through the tissue via molecular collisions and vibrations. Then the beam is either reflected or refracted by the transducer received and then converted into electric current that's then displayed in an image. So the most kind of unsophisticated ultrasounds were the transmission method where the receiver was actually positioned on the opposite side of the specimen. Then we see the pulse reflection method where the receiver and the transmitter are on the same side. There are basically three different categories, A mode or amplitude, which is our most basic 1D image that has the greater the signal returned by the transducer, the higher the spike or the amplitude, 
B mode, which is brightness. That's the most commonly used mode today. It's a 2D characterization of tissue that relates the brightness of an image to the amplitude of an ultrasound wave. And finally, we have M mode or motion mode, which basically relates the amplitude of an ultrasound wave to a moving structure. So the first report of musculoskeletal ultrasonography was actually published in 1958 where ultrasound was used to measure the acoustic continuations of articular and periarticular tissues. These initial developments were led in the field by radiologists. However, ultrasound, um, over, ultrasound over time gradually became adopted by other fields as the technology improved, but its practical application in MSK disease didn't really become more widespread until the diagnosis of congenital hip dislocation on ultrasound. So in this paper in 1980, um, outlines the practical results of ultrasound making the diagnosis of hip dislocations over an 18 month period, emphasizing particularly how this method is going to be harmless to the patient, economical and simple to perform. Um, and this paper he describes taking on average four minutes to image both hips. But I think my favorite part of the study was actually how they documented their findings by taking kind of a Polaroid picture of the image and putting it up. So while we've gone a long way from this picture on the left, to this well-known view on the right that can appear in our orthopedic boards, I think ultrasound diagnosis and in infant hips have greatly approved our ability to screen without the inherent risk of radiation. And that's probably one of the biggest draws to using ultrasound, particularly in the pediatric population, is reducing ionizing radiation. So on average, a person in the US receives a dose of three millisieverts per year. And this is just a table uh, of completion for average radiation doses for common, Im common imaging studies, uh, with CT being the most, uh, X-ray being the least. And when we look at these images, it's important to understand the echogeneity of different musculoskeletal structures. So tendons in the surface of bone are going to appear hyperechoic or have a bright echo. Muscle is going to be hypoechoic or have a dim echo. Uh, simple fluid is going to be anechoic or no uh, echo, and then certain structures such as peripheral nerves are going to have a mixed hyper hypoechoic picture. So when we look specifically at ultrasound in the pediatric world, this review article uh, from our own institution highlights its clinical applications. So as previously discussed, one of the most common uses is in the screening diagnosis for hip dysplasia. You can also use it to monitor the treatment of dysplasia. But there are reports of using ultrasound to diagnose SCIFI, as well as looking at FAI, although it is not great for evaluating labor, late the labrum or deep articular structures. You can use it for a dynamic evaluation of psoas tendon, psoas tendon with snapping hip pathology, help guide your injections for the assessment, monitoring correction, and even evaluating recurrent deformities in patients with club foot, looking at different forms of sacral dysphrafism and tethered cord, looking at uh, the management of peripheral nerve injuries for neonatal brachial plexus, helping to guide our Botox injections, looking at foreign bodies, such as the picture below. This was an x-ray negative patient who actually had a splinter in their hand, and also diagnosing hemangiomas, which is the most uh, common soft tissue tumor in kids. So as we can see, ultrasound can be particularly useful in evaluating soft tissues. And one of the most studied areas um, is actually looking at uh, the uh, tendons of the shoulder. So this study compared ultrasound uh, with MRI, and it's been shown to have equal accuracy for detecting both full and partial thickness rotator cuff tears. And this has been proven uh, in multiple studies in the literature with ultrasound having equal uh, sensitivity, specificity, and predictive values. And beginning orthopedic surgeons, um, which they defined as less than one year of experience, were able to identify rotator cuff tears with high accuracy as well. They didn't see any difference in sensitivity or specificity when comparing ultrasound performed by orthopedic surgeons versus radiologists. And another study indicates that patients with shoulder pain actually preferred ultrasound to MRI, with the main reasons being MRI too long and higher patient um, satisfaction with regards to pain. There's also even a high accuracy in the post-operative period after patients have gone a rotator cuff repair, looking at tendon healing versus re-tears with ultrasound. And it's also useful uh, for evaluating uh, ankles and uh, tendons and ligaments in the ankle. Uh, so this used ultrasound to look at the interosseous ligament for high ankle sprains, looking at syndesmotic injuries with ankle fractures, having a high sensitivity and specificity. You can look at impingement at the posterior tibial tendon, as well as fraying or subluxing perineal tendons. This one study showed that ultrasound was actually more sensitive and accurate than MRI in detecting ankle tears. So this is just a picture. Uh, first on the left, we have a transverse view uh, demonstrating how you could see this normal hyperechoic structure, but a break in the middle. And then kind of just putting the probe on the opposite um, ankle, you can see the continuous hyperechoic hyper structure indicating an intact ligament. 
Um, so for looking at tendons in the hand, ultrasound can be especially uh, helpful, especially when the exam is limited by pain. It can detect flexor tendon lacerations, as well as localizing the proximal stump, which in some cases can reduce your need for intraoperative exploration. It also is useful for evaluating postoperative tendon rupture, kind of differentiating that from adhesive scarring. So this is a patient who came in um, with loss of motion, and the question was whether or not there's scarring or repeat, repeat rupture. This ultrasound image probe was placed in clinic. You can kind of see a gap in the tendon here. Uh, so it can be particularly useful for getting answering a simple question in your office without having to go back uh, to the OR. Uh, so for a dynamic exam, uh, it also is a unique feature of ultrasound. Uh, being able to evaluate kind of chronic soft tissue ankle injuries, this study found that ultrasound uh, was specific for diagnosing correctly 14 of 17 ATFL tears. Looking at the thumb, uh, specifically a dynamic exam for looking at UCL injuries and uh, accurately identifying operative center lesions. An additional feature of ultrasound is you can use the water bath technique, uh, which can reduce the discomfort and allow a dynamic exam by just placing the patient's extremity um, underneath lukewarm water with the transducer on top as pictured there. So other things we can see with ultrasound, it's also useful for compressive neuropathies. It's actually been shown to have a sensitivity comparable to that of nerve conduction studies. Uh, it's gonna be cheap and more comfortable for the patient. Uh, usually median nerve enlargement uh, with a cross-sectional area of 10 millimeters uh, squared is the most common parameter used to diagnose uh, carpal tunnel syndrome on ultrasound. It's been also uh, identified as useful in uh, uh, diagnosing cubital tunnel syndrome, with again, a similar cutoff, but with the use of ultrasound, you can also do a dynamic evaluation to look for ulnar nerve subluxation. So these top pictures, this is uh, the normal anatomy of the carpal tunnel with the transverse carpal ligament up top. Here you can see an enlarged median nerve in these two uh, pictures below. So Cochrane review showed that ultrasound with nerve blocks has a superior motor and sensory blockade. It's also been able to detect occult dorsal ganglion cysts with a high sensitivity um, equal to MRI. Uh, it's been used to assess neuroma locations, differentiating symptomatic neuromas from other symptoms of phantom limb pain, and also has been successfully able to diagnose radial nerve transections and the setting of closed humeral shaft fractures. So we think about ultrasound and evaluating things that we normally can't see on x-ray, uh, but here's something where ultrasound has been useful in evaluating bony uh, injuries, particularly looking at callus progression. So normally on x-ray, it takes about six to eight weeks for callus to be present and beyond, uh, but here you can use 2D ultrasound to evaluate soft tissue bridging callus, particularly in the early fracture healing stages. And this can be particularly helpful in the presence of metallic hardware, as you can adjust the probe to visualize areas uh, free of interference. So this picture on the left shows kind of the normal cortical bone. Here you can see the hump bridging callus uh, crossing the fracture site. This picture on the right uh, shows, oops, excuse me, uh, cortical, um, uh, basically normal cortical bone. Here you can see the gap at the fracture site. This is just the corresponding x-ray. So in terms of whether or not this helps, uh, this study basically used ultrasound to see if it can predict delayed union. They had 14 tibia fractures that were managed with intramedullary nail, and they prospectively scanned them every two weeks until union was noted. They found that the most reliable predictor of union was gonna be progressive loss of visualization of your nail at the fracture site. They were able to see bridging callus on ultrasound on an average 6.5 weeks versus 19 weeks for x-ray. And this other study looking at ultrasound for helping to diagnose um, uh, unclear um, soft, tissue in, uh, uh, soft tissue injuries in the upper extremity, uh, they basically had 195 patients with an unclear diagnosis that ultimately had ultrasound. 43% of these end up having surgery. And they found that there was actually a better agreement between the ultrasound and operative diagnosis than between the clinical and operative diagnosis. And in those cases, ultrasound was able to change the management from some patients to non-operative treatment, adapting the surgical approach, as well as choosing the choice of anesthesia. So what else can we learn from ultrasound? It's been used to identify wound and fluid collections that may be associated with surgical site infections. We know there's a growing, um, there's uh, soft tissue and skin, uh, soft tissues infections and skin infections have doubled um, over the past 10 years. Ultrasound has a greater sensitivity and specificity compared to your clinical exam. It's been shown to be similar uh, to a CT scan. Uh, so using it to visualize fluid collections around a plate, differentiating that from bursa. Um, and this may perhaps lead to an earlier detection 
of infection or reduce the need for unnecessary INDs. So this is just an ultrasound picture of an abscess cavity compared to cellulitis with the classic cobblestoning appearance that you'll see, which is basically just fluid surrounding the echogenic st structures in the subcutaneous tissue. So when you talk about implicating this and uh, implementing this in your practice, uh, some of the biggest reservations from a survey of orthopedic surgeons showed there was a concern for false positive and false negative results, a lack of experience, as well as inf insufficient training. But when you ask yourself, can you apply it in your practice? I'm here to tell you that, yes, you can. We know that Rome wasn't built in a day, and similar to arthroscopy, with time and practice, you can get facile at ultrasound. And there's actually research here to prove it. So this study looked at 15 orthopedic residents and their ability to measure ankle or tendons after a multimedial tutorial. They found that their accuracy and comfort level improved and the majority of residents actually plan to use it in their practice afterwards. This next study similarly involved an ultrasound course, which is basically two hours of online videos followed by a four hour long half day course. They evaluated residents with a written pre-course, a same day post-course, six month follow-up, as well as um, scoring on a practical shoulder exam. And they found that their written scores may, were maintained. At the six month follow-up, there was a decrease in their practical exam scores, but the comfort levels with all after ultrasound um, technology had improved at six months. And this just, just doesn't apply to residents. This study looked at uh, hand surgery fellows uh, after they completed uh, basically a 30 minute ultrasound course, looked at them before and one month after, and they found that participants' performance for identifying structures improved, as well as the average time to completion decreased. And this applies basically to orthopedists of all training levels. This next study uh, found that after a brief teaching workshop, their proficiency in detecting rotator cuff tears specifically was comparable to an experienced radiologist or an MR orthogram. And as surgeons, we already have a profound knowledge of this patient's anatomy. So that combined with the knowledge of the patient's clinical symptoms actually makes us ideal candidates for using ultrasound. So this study, um, interpretation by a surgeon of ultrasound images after a clinical exam with the patient was actually more accurate than a blind interpretation by a radiologist. So in terms of coding and billing, just for completion's sake, uh, there are separate CPT codes for ultrasound. Um, these are the associated RVUs with it. Uh, if you are doing it for an injection, again, it is going to be more, but that is not me advocating for using ultrasound for every injection. Uh, while it can be useful in their studies, for example, Dacor vein sinusinovitis um, is shown to have better clinical outcomes, but for using it for kind of all major large joints, while it does improve accuracy, the literature shows that it doesn't help clinical function, particularly with in terms of pain and function. Uh, and this last um, is just like a level three office visit, how many RBUs do you get for that for resident background information? In terms of future uh, advancements in ultrasound, one of the primary limitations of 2D ultrasound is the difficulty interpreting the image. However, 3D ultrasound has the ability to overcome these shortcomings. Uh, most of the work in this is actually done in the scoliosis world uh, with the scoli, scoli scan, which is basically a 3D ultrasound assessment. Uh, but there are specific limitations, particularly um, interference, the bone boundary thickness, your field of view, and we're also lacking validation studies. But future exam advancements with this technology uh, will make the integration of this modality easier. This is just an example of kind of the bridging callus that you can see over time with 3D ultrasound. Also on the horizon, uh, Dr. Rice will be doing a study looking at soft tissue infections with ultrasound. Uh, so be on the lookout for this as well as possibly a resident training course for us to become more familiar with using it. As we think back to our, page, uh, our cases, this uh, former college athlete on the court, uh, luckily one of his co-residents was there with an ultrasound probe uh, in their uh, bag. So they're able to stick it to the ankle and here you can see calcaneus, gastroc, uh, Achilles tendon rupture. So this was able to kind of facilitate this patient's care where they didn't have to wait around for an MRI. They're able to get in uh, and get immediately seen. This patient with the pacemaker was actually unable to have an MRI. So here you can see a uh, full thickness supraspinatus tear on both the long and short axes of ultrasound. And finally, our baseball player who had, uh, was ended up having an UCL tear. And here's just a dynamic video showing gapping or opening up of the ulnar humeral joint with a dynamic ultrasound exam. So in terms of uh, why you would prefer ultrasound, affordability, it's gonna be much cheaper than MRI. 
In terms of accessibility, it's portable. You could do it in clinic. It's a one-stop shop. Your patients will have to be sent out for an MRI and come back. I think it's best for answering specific clinical questions that you have. Uh, accessibility of MRI. I know I still have patients at CMC Maine waiting around for an MRI from back when I was in trauma last year. In terms of accuracy, I've shown the applications where it can be equivalent to MRI. The ability to form a dynamic exam is unique to ultrasound. Patient satisfaction, they actually prefer it. And it's relying on the physician, so you're not relying on an outside person, a radiologist, or a technician. So we've seen the growth and evolution of technology, specifically the global market for ultrasound, which is expected to increase from 6, 6 billion in 2018 to around 8 billion by 2023. Uh, there's a growing expansion for the use of ultrasound, and I've tried to demonstrate some of its applications in orthopedics, only meant as an introduction uh, to its utility in our practice. So I think it's important we just keep an open mind as technology continues to evolve, because we don't wanna end up like this guy or the founder of BlackBerry, we basically stubbornly clung to the idea that people would not want to use their smartphone from anything other than email or phone calls or texting. So thank you so much for all who have helped me prepare. That's great, Risa. Um, enjoyed that uh, review. If you want to uh, stop sharing your screen there and we can uh, look around for uh, questions. Um, I guess the first question that I might uh, pose to you is that Clearly, it's become more commonly used, but the big transition for something that's sort of treated as a novelty is that transition to when does it become sort of the standard of care or the gold standard for certain things. So in your review, you had a pretty comprehensive review of the different uh, you know, uses of it. Um, what are going to be, you know, the in your mind, the first, I don't know, first couple of things where it is truly the gold standard and in common day orthopedic practice, if you're not using it, you're antiquated. So in terms of the gold standard, I'm not sure kind of, I think I can think of several applications um, where I think if you're answering a specific clinical question, um, it can be useful. I think right now, particularly with ultrasound and getting FASO with it, it's really more seen as an adjunct. So kind of, I think, in orthopedics, it can help us determine maybe which patients you do need an MRI instead of pulling the trigger and getting an MRI on everyone. Um, right now, I think it has very useful um, kind of advancements with particularly kind of diagnosing carpal tunnel in the office and not sending patients out for nerve conduction studies. But I think it's not going to be an end-all be-all for a gold standard because I, you have to kind of evaluate the patient. So in that situation, if your patient's having maybe kind of neck symptoms, you might want to do the nerve conduction study because then you're going to see kind of more, uh, is this peripheral um, nerve related or not? So I, right now, I don't foresee it being the gold standard for anything. I think it's more seen as an adjunct to kind of helping our clinical diagnosis. I think for some soft tissue infections, um, it can definitely help in, in, to avoid basically getting advanced imaging such as CT scan. If you can kind of put an ultrasound probe to it and then know that's your diagnosis, then your patient doesn't have to go through the CT scan for all that. But right now, I think it's still kind of mainly for adjunct and kind of helping answer a specific clinical question that you might have. See, I think that's a, it's a good, you know, points you raised there in your answer, but the question is, like for carpal tunnel, uh, the benefit of ultrasound is that the surgeons can actually bill for it and get real-time information, so it's sort of a dual-fold benefit, but for payers, when are they going to recognize or reward people for not getting those nerve conduction study tests, not getting the MRI? Is there a time, is there a classic presentation where somebody has just, you know, a perfect clinical exam for carpal tunnel, has a correlating ultrasound, and you don't get anything else? And, you know, that's going to be that transition point that we see with, with this technology and its, and its uh, integration into our practice. Anybody uh, have any other comments or questions? Hey, Risa and Josh, it's Natty. Um, I can give you a little bit of a different perspective on it. I, in my fellowship uh, at Wash U in St. Louis, they're, they're probably considered the world's leader in using shoulder ultrasound as a primary di diagnostic tool for rotator cuff tears. And I was excited about that when I went there for fellowship. I was excited to learn about it and use it and have it as part of my practice. But when I got there, I realized that the surgeons don't do the ultrasounds at all. 
it was all done by the radiologists and the, and radiology technicians that have been doing them for years. And I learned very quickly that it's actually uh, has a really steep learning curve and you can't really learn it in a half day. It's something that uh, takes a little bit more practice than that. And, and the quality of the images are pretty user dependent. So when you look at the literature, you got to be careful about how they're doing it in their in their system. A lot of times it's done by a radiologists and they have a factory and they have experienced radiologists that are really good at it. And in other places, it's the orthopedic surgeon who's just kind of learning it on the fly. And I think that's a little dangerous and can be misleading about how you're getting the ultrasounds and, and how they're trained. Uh, there's some there's some people around Charlotte that are learning how to do it. I think that's fine, but I don't, I don't think the message should be that this is something you can learn really quickly or through an online course. It's, I did it myself and I learned it in the last few years or a few months of my fellowship. And it's actually pretty challenging to get good quality images. Um, so I think if you are going to start to use it in your practice, which I fully endorse, a good way to do it is to do ultrasounds, but then not bill for them. And then uh, also get an MRI or the other gold standard diagnostic tool for a while until you feel really comfortable that you're able to uh, diagnose things well, because this could be the difference of somebody having surgery or not. If you're, if you're, if you're calling a full thickness cuff tear on your ultrasound, but it just, I, I think there's a way of doing it safely. Uh, and, and if you, if you, if you have, if you're going to commit to it, you have to commit to it. Your practice has to commit to it because the ultrasound machines aren't cheap. They take you a while too. So if you're going to do it as the orthopedic surgeon, you just have to have the resources to do it. It's going to take you about 30 minutes in the office once you first start to do them. And you got to get a good machine. And then for a while, you should probably back it up with MRIs until you feel really comfortable with your ability to diagnose things. So I thought it was a great review. And I do think there's huge potential for us to use this in orthopedics moving forward. Reese, I don't, I don't know if any of the primary care guys are on, on the call. They've actually had more experience than the rest of us have with this. They use it every day in their clinic. But um, one of the, the other end of the spectrum, Josh, from standard of care, which is over here, is sort of the cutting edge. And they now have these butterfly ultrasounds they can take on the sideline. And if somebody gets an injury on the sideline, they can actually evaluate it right now. So I'd almost be interested in hearing a little bit about that. Reese, I don't know if you came up with anything. Um, you can phone a friend. I see Eric Warren there. Um, if you, if you haven't had any experience with it or read about it. Yeah, so I, I briefly yeah, talked I mean, to Dr. Price about I'm sorry, it. go ahead. Sorry, Dr. Warren, you could um, probably elaborate more basically what Dr. Price was telling me um, was the ability, I think the quality has improved over time and he does have this port about portable um, ultrasound that they can take to the sideline, but I'll let you elaborate more, Dr. Warren. Yeah, yeah, sorry to interrupt. Um, I, first, I'll say great presentation. Um, secondly, fully endorse uh, getting the, the MRI and looking with the ultrasound and even doing that afterwards. If you have the MRI result, then putting the ultrasound on to find the, the findings that were seen on the MRI. But in terms of portable ultrasound on the sidelines, it's, it's a great uh, satisfier both professionally and for the athlete to be able to look real time, make return to play decisions is the weakness based off of pain or is it based off a structural defect? Those are great things to be able to determine. The one caveat I'll give is that if you bust out a portable ultrasound on the sideline, be prepared for most everyone to want something looked at. So um, I've even had coaches who wanted something that's hurt looked at since it's right there waiting for them. So you, you better be ready to use it if you, if you show it there. Great. Let's see, Eric, uh, see Chris, I see you've had your uh, hand up here. Um, maybe one last question before we move on to Dr. Haynes. Yeah, uh, one question for, um, I don't know if this would be for Reese or perhaps one of the uh, primary care guys, but, you know, I've thought about uh, asking for an ultrasound machine in negotiations with jobs. And one of the obvious questions there is how many injections would you have to do before you would cover the cost of the machine? Uh, so that you hit a break-even point. And I know this came up a lot with Ortho Carolina when Dr. Weeks was starting here. Um, any input from a from a dollars and cents perspective from anybody who uses this thing more often than us? So, Eric, I think that's a reasonable question. We'll see, Eric, Dr. Warren, maybe you can answer that for us or try. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of these. 
a lot of these machines um, you can do on a per month lease or, or in terms of capital, um, how you're depreciating and paying that back. Um, so it only takes a couple ultrasound injections uh, usually to make that 250 to $350 uh, monthly coverage. So it's, it's really not a whole lot that you have to be able to do to cover the cost. And I think the other thing, uh, Eric, you'll see, not just with this, but anything, and there's a good lesson for all residents going into practice, is that it's also a differentiator. So it may not be a hard dollars and cents, you know, even exchange, but if you can bring something different or unique, and it's something that's marketable, that, you know, gives you a certain, you know, cachet in your community, um, you know, there are some side benefits to that. So, you know, whenever you're asking for something, be thoughtful about how you can sort of sell it, if you will, to your practice, to your hospital, whatever it may be, um, in terms of what you could bring that's a little bit different um, and, you know, what the future is. And, and, you know, leaning back on this talk and understanding what other potential uses in the future for your practice would be might help you sell that. So I think it's a good example of how you, how you can look for something that you want in your practice maybe, um, and figure out a way to, uh, to make it more broadly applicable uh, or marketable. So, well, Risa, thank you very much for a, a great first talk this morning. I think everybody enjoyed that. And we will uh, let Dr. Haynes come on over and we're going to uh, hear about patella fractures for the second half of the uh, talk this morning. All right, thanks, Dr. Pat. Um, go ahead and get started. I'm going to talk uh, a little bit today, just review uh, patella fractures. Um, I have no disclosures to report, and we'll go ahead and start with some cases. Uh, the first one is a 57-year-old female who slipped at the airport. Um, she had immediate onset pain and inability to extend her left knee. She was brought to uh, the uh, CMC emergency department um, and was noted to have effusion uh, and ecchymosis, and again, she couldn't extend her knee. Uh, case two uh, is a little uh, more complex. It's a 22-year-old male uh, who's a professional hockey player. Uh, he's presenting for a second opinion. He had uh, ACL reconstruction five months ago uh, by another surgeon with a, a bone patellar tendon bone autographed, um, and has been having some anterior knee pain for the past three months, as well as some weakness with extension. Uh, when he went to go see his surgeon, uh, he was noted to have a slightly lax uh, test, on a Lachman test compared to post-op. Um, so the, the MRI was repeated, and, and here you can see that uh, two cuts of the ACL, which appears slightly bulbous, um, but overall looks like the graft is intact. Uh, this was also noted on his MRI, uh, the stellate fracture uh, of the patella, which was um, you know, minimally displaced. Uh, when he came to our clinic, uh, these were the x-rays we obtained. Um, he did not have any additional injuries, uh, you know, after the uh, initial tearing, rupturing of his ACL. Uh, just some basics on patella fractures and the patella in general. Um, it's the largest sesamoid bone in the body, uh, articulates with the medial and lateral facets of the distal femur, um, making it a direct arterial plane joint. Uh, the dorsal surface is subcutaneous, uh, which it makes it easy for surgical exposure, but presents challenges in avoiding symptomatic hardware. Um, I think an interesting point about the patella is that uh, only the superior 75% uh, of the patella's height is uh, composed of articular cartilage. Um, and that cartilage is very thick, some of the thickest in the body, at up to one centimeter thick. Uh, biomechanically, um, it functions to increase the distance of applied force from the center of knee rotation. Uh, this has been shown to increase the moment arm of the quadriceps by up to 3%. Um, it undergoes uh, loading primarily during extension um, and undergoes uh, tension, compression, and three-point bending while the knee is being flexed. Um, so uh, now we'll kind of talk about patella fractures, which are all um, come in many different shapes and sizes. Uh, there are multiple classifications. Uh, first one I'm sure we're all familiar with is the AO classification, um, which you can see here. Uh, it classifies them as extra articular, partial articular, and complete uh, articular fractures. It has not been shown to be very helpful uh, and is not commonly used. More commonly what we do uh, use is this uh, fracture pattern classification, um, which really is just a descriptive classification, whether the, um, 
you know, fracture line is horizontal versus vertical, uh, displaced, non-displaced, um, inferior pole or superior pole fracture, or an osteochondral lesion. Um, there are two main mechanisms uh, for patella fractures, uh, and I think this is important. The first one is failure under tension. Uh, this usually happens when the quadriceps is eccentrically loaded, um, in a trans results in a transverse fracture uh, or inferior pole avulsion. Um, commonly, the uh, extensor mechanism is disrupted as well as some of the knee retinaculum. Um, and then the second um, common mechanism we see is from a direct blow to the anterior knee. Um, this is most commonly seen uh, in patients that are involved in uh, motor vehicle collisions uh, where their knee hits the dashboard. Um, and usually results in a multifragmentary or stellate pattern. Um, and interestingly, uh, greater than 50% of these uh, fractures from this mechanism are non-displaced uh, or have an intact uh, extensor mechanism. On physical exam, you see a hemarthrosis, uh, palpable uh, defect or fracture gap and inability to extend the knee. Um, and then keep an eye out for open fractures um, just as there. So, uh, close to the um, skin and subcutaneous tissue. If there's any question, you can saline load test the knee to be sure. Uh, treatment of these fractures, um, so non-operative uh, treatment is usually reserved for minimally displaced fractures uh, with an intact extensor mechanism or uh, displaced fractures uh, in those who are too medically fragile to undergo surgery. Um, usually this consists of immobilization for four to six weeks uh, before starting uh, range of motion exercises. And patients can be placed in a long leg cast um, or a knee immobilizer or a hinge knee brace, depending on uh, how you think their compliance will be. Um, operative options, uh, there are many, and this is not an all-inclusive list. Um, I'm going to try and highlight some of the uh, most common methods we use, as well as some of the advancements that have been made uh, over the past several decades. Um, indications for surgery. Uh, really, I think the biggest uh, takeaway from this is if the patient has a disrupted extensor mechanism, um, you know, that is probably the most absolute indication, uh, you know, as far as displacement of greater than two to four millimeters or step off of greater than two to three millimeters. I cited a paper below that was a review article, and um, this is what they recommended. When I went back and looked at their primary source, there was no, uh, no absolute uh, mention of these numbers, rather, it just said that it's okay to treat, uh, you know, non-operative patella fractures non-operatively if displacement is less than one millimeter. So I think there's still work to do. We don't really know. Uh, obviously, if there is displacement, it pushes you towards operating. Uh, and then anybody with an intra-articular loose body, um, as well as open fractures, certainly need to think about um, fixing those as well. Um, the goals of surgery are the same for basically any, any fracture we treat. You want an anatomic reduction at the articular surface um, and interfragmentary compression to allow for primary bone healing when possible. Uh, some other things to think about are associated injuries, as these are common in uh, polytrauma patients. Patients' age and functional status or comorbidities, uh, their bone quality and how much purchase you can get uh, in your fixation, uh, the patient's weight as they will be weight bearing on this eventually, and then their uh, compliance with your post-operative uh, recommendations. So the, the tension band technique was the gold standard for a long time. Uh, it still remains the most common technique. Uh, it is uh, best for transverse fractures, and it's thought to lead to dynamic compression at the articular surface uh, with the knee in flexion, although recent publications may have called this or have called this into question. I think you know this is a extensive topic that could be debated at a later date and is outside the scope of my talk today. Um, this was traditionally used with two K wires, um, you know, uh, perpendicular to the fracture site, and then an 18 gauge stainless steel wire uh, and a figure of eight uh, pattern to provide compression. Uh, this retrospective study done in 1985 looked at 100 patients. Uh, although some uh, were not included in the final analysis for random reasons. Um, subjectively, they had 72% uh, excellent or good outcomes after undergoing a tension banding construct. Uh, and objectively, when they looked at their, uh, you know, 
quadriceps wasting and strength uh, and range of motion, they felt that about 80% of them had excellent or good outcomes. Uh, but there were many complications uh, with the tension band back then. 32% uh, were noted to have inadequate reduction with articular step off. 37% uh, had a broken wire loop. Um, and then 15% had pain requiring hardware removal. Uh, and there was noted to be a low infection rate. Uh, similar uh, results were found in this meta-analysis out of HSS in 2012 uh, that looked at rates of reoperation, uh, infection, and non-union. Um, notably, infection and non-union are low, but the reoperation rate uh, in all these studies they analyzed uh, was 33.6%, uh, which seems extremely high. Uh, you know, a biomechanical study done. Um, Looking for a solution to this, uh, people have looked at using a polyester uh, suture uh, instead of the tension banding technique uh, in order to prevent uh, prominent hardware. Uh, this study was done on transverse fractures and cadavers created using an osteotome, and they used uh, created a tension band using suture. Uh, they found that the tensile strength of the braided polyester was lower, um, as seen on the graph on the right, but did not fail after 2,000 cycles. And they thought felt that it was a, a uh, you know acceptable alternative to tension banding with K wires and uh, and wires and and thought you know fewer hardware issues. Um, you know a follow up study of that people started using cannulated screws across the fracture site for transverse fractures, um, and then fixing it with um, you know fiber wire going through the through the cannulated screws in a figure of eight fashion. Um, this study uh, is another study done on cadavers in Florida in 2015. Um, they performed the construct I mentioned previously, and it showed statistically no difference um, in fracture site displacement or maximum load to failure between uh, the steel and fiber wire uh, with cannulated screw constructs. Um, because fiber wire was not significantly weaker, uh, this was also recommended over traditional uh, tension banding. And then just to add to that, uh, these authors uh, did a did a retrospective study looking at actual patients um, where they did uh, cannulated screws across a transverse fracture site um, and then fixed it with um, fiber wire and a figure of eight pattern, as well as a running locking cerclage uh, around the patella. Um, and overall, they had good outcomes. 49 went on to radiographic union at an average of three months, uh, you know, only four patients, uh, which was 8%, had to have uh, hardware uh, removals or additional surgeries. And three of those were due to prominent screws. Um, and then just notably the, the range of motion, uh, almost zero degrees in extension and an average of around 120 degrees of flexion in their patients at two year follow-up. Uh, you know, plates are another option and are gaining popularity uh, throughout the orthopedic community. Uh, they're most commonly used for multi-fragmentary fractures. Although they're gaining popularity for more simple fractures as well as they become more low profile uh, and uh, somewhat cheaper. Um, the, sorry about that. Um, these are uh, located dorsally, uh, directly subcutaneously, and uh, you know the fracture is reduced uh, and either uh, held in place with screws um, or clamps until the, the plate can be applied. And then you just have to think about cost when using this fixation method as it is more expensive. This biomechanical study performed in 2012 um, tested the durability of traditional anterior tension wire uh, versus cannulated screws with tension wire. Uh, versus 2.7 millimeter fixed angle plates, which you can see on the right. Uh, they cyclically loaded uh, the knee and ran it for 100 cycles. And what you can see here is that the fixed angle uh, plate performed uh, the best compared to screws and tension wire versus tension wire uh, and K wires. Likewise, uh, you know, and in, in, uh, for a clinical perspective, this study uh, was done out of Beaumont Hospital in 2017. Uh, they looked at 12 patients with isolated displaced patella fractures, nine of which were multi-fragmentary. Uh, they had a mean follow-up of 19 months, uh, looking at their radiographs, functional outcomes, and uh, physical exam. Uh, all of the patients went on to have union by 12 months and had satisfactory functional outcomes per the authors. Um, and there were no reoperations uh, in cases of infection, uh, non-union or symptomatic hardware among their study group. Going even lower profile, um, uh, surgeons have started using this uh, contourable craniofacial mesh plate osteosynthesis uh, for patella fractures. This is actually a case series 
uh, out of Ohio State in 2019, looking at only four patients, three of which had combinated fractures. Uh, they used independent screws in this, this mesh plate, which you can see here, um, that is extremely low profile. They had 100% union rate. They had no symptomatic hardware. Uh, the only downside they felt uh, in this study was the increased cost at $660 versus 345 for more standard mesh plates. Uh, you know, an option uh, in these cases is always patellectomy. Um, you know, doing a total patellectomy uh, is rarely indicated in cases of tumor uh, infection or revision surgery is when it's most commonly used. And it leads to about a 50% reduction in quad strength. So um, try to avoid that at all possible and it's become less popular uh, over the past several decades. And then partial patellectomy, uh, there certainly is a you know, case for this to be used. Um, it's reserved for extremely combinated fractures of the inferior pole, uh, especially when the patients have uh, poor bone quality and the patellar tendon can be advanced. Uh, this sometimes leads to patella baja and then alteration of the uh, extensor forces on the knee. Um, you know, a, a couple of studies or one study showed up to 55% of patients developing osteoarthritis uh, in their uh, patellofemoral compartment at two year follow up. Um, and then it's recommended to leave at least 60% of the patella when doing a patellectomy. You know, speaking of inferior pole fractures, uh, there are other options for this as well, including a basket plate, um, wire fixation, suture fixation, or the patellectomy. Um, this 2016 study compared, um, excuse me, fixation of inferior pole fractures with suture anchors, um, as shown on the right. Um, for, or partial pedalectomy. Uh, they retrospectively looked at 60 patients, 27 of which were treated with the suture anchors and 33 of which had the partial pedalectomy. Um, both groups had similar numbers of complications, uh, including infections and reoperations. However, um, the suture anchor also had additional non-union implant, implant failures that the pedalectomy hadn't seen. The authors did recommend though that uh, this was an acceptable fixation technique as there was a shorter overall operative time of 68.5 minutes versus 79.1 uh, minutes. And then they also noted that, you know, it's a good alternative to basket plates, which have up to a 50% need for hardware removal. And these are some more interesting techniques I found in the literature, um, none of which are used commonly uh, today per se. This one has to do with uh, nitinol uh, staples. The AO Institute looked at this using two nitinol staples for transverse patella fractures and cadavers. Um, they found that it performed better than traditional tension band wiring construct and thought that it may have uh, potential implications for uh, future fixation techniques. Um, as they noted here, it has a promising potential to treat transverse patella fractures. Um, you know, nitinol, as far as clinical applications go, this study out of China uh, used a combo of cannulated screws and nitinol plates to fix uh, patella fractures and had excellent or good outcomes in 92.6% of patients. Uh, and then a 2006 study out of Turkey even used an X-fix uh, in order, circular ring X-fix in order to preserve soft tissues and patella fractures, although this has uh, not caught on in clinical practice. Um, Post-op protocol, there's really no clear uh, consensus for these patients. Um, each rehab program should be modified to fit each individual case, given the patient's age, bone quality, fixation type, um, and fixation stability. Um, you know, they're traditionally kept in a, in a locked-in extension for four to six weeks, and our weight bearing is tolerated at, after that time. Uh, they then go on to progressive range of motion exercises and are performing active extension strengthening at 12 weeks. But more recently, um, to avoid knee stiffness, uh, patients have uh, begun, I mean, uh, you know, providers have begun advancing uh, range of motion exercises earlier. This study uh, looked at uh, patients treated with low profile mesh plates for combinated uh, patella fractures. Um, nine patients were casted for two weeks um, and then placed in a hinge knee brace until union. Um, range of motion was started at two weeks post-op under PT supervision, um, and all these patients had good or excellent results. Going back to our cases, um, case one, this 57-year-old female, you can see here, she has that transverse fracture best seen on the lateral, but she also has these two small uh, intraarticular fragments noted here. 
she was treated with this low profile mesh plate that was contoured to fit her anatomy. Uh, several independent screws were placed from inferior to superior uh, to create compression at the fracture sites. Um, and then the locking plate was applied. She was kept in a knee immobilizer until two weeks post-op, at which point she could range from zero to 30 degrees and then advance 10 degrees a week after that. Um, she was last seen uh, in December of 2021 virtually, uh, was doing well. She had some anterior knee pain and she had full extension by then, um, but flexion was limited to 80 degrees. Um, she was going to continue formal physical therapy to get her range of motion back. Um, but overall was doing very well. Uh, case two was our 22 year old male hockey pro player who presented for a second opinion after it was recommended he undergo ACL revision. Um, he was referred to our uh, trauma surgeon at Atrium who treated with him with an uh, uh, tension band technique using uh, cannulated screws and 18 gauge wires in a figure of eight fashion. Um, afterwards, arthroscopy was performed, which demonstrated an intact uh, ACL graft and no other significant um, injuries. Here are his uh, fluoro shots from the case. Uh, he was made protective weight bearing until his quad tone returned. Uh, he began PT at two weeks uh, to work on range of motion and some gentle strengthening and his range of motion was advanced at six weeks. Uh, he was last seen three and a half months after surgery. He then moved uh, to train for the off season. His range of motion was zero to 90 degrees, um, and he has never come back for uh, any hardware issues or any other problems. Um, he is still playing minor league hockey to this day and, and uh, has four goals on the season thus far, so it's doing great. Um, and then uh, this study you know, looking at the incidence of uh, patella fractures and their outcomes after ACL reconstruction uh, was uh, published in arthroscopy in 2002. Uh, they looked at um, these 618 patients and found eight of them with fractures, uh, which is consistent with the uh, literature showing about a 0.23% to 2.3% incidence after um, ACL reconstruction with bone patellar bone tendon uh, autograft. Um, and then also consistent with the literature, you know, these, these patients either had uh, stellate or transverse fractures um, after these, this mechanism. Um, three occurred from direct trauma and five occurred from indirect trauma. And at a mean of 57 days post-op, um, five of these were displaced uh, and went on to fixation. Uh, overall, they had a 75% uh, patients had good or excellent lysome scores at follow-up. So in conclusion, um, you know, most of these displaced fractures uh, benefit from fixation, especially when the extensor mechanism is disrupted. Uh, to present day, there still is a high rate of reoperation for hardware removal. Um, I think future studies need to be done uh, to determine whether, you know, plates uh, really do help decrease this uh, or the, the suture with uh, cannulated screws. Um, can help. We still don't have a, a, a great answer, although it seems we're moving in the right directions. Um, and then, um, you know, the question of whether or not these patients, their weight bearing can be advanced earlier, I think, um, you know, we have starting to have some evidence showing that this is a good idea and can be done safely uh, without um, worrying about non-union of these patients. Um, and, and, you know, the, the takeaway here is that the management is, is really patient and uh, surgeon dependent um, in most of these instances. I want to give a special thanks to those who helped me with this presentation. Uh, here are my references, and I'll open it up to any questions. Excellent. Thanks, Bryce. Um, appreciate that. Uh, my favorite thing to do with a uh, patella fracture when it comes in is to refer it to someone else. Um, <laughs> I find that to be uh, the most satisfactory way to treat extensive me extensor mechanism uh, injuries. Um, you know, certainly the um, you bring up some great points um, in terms of hardware prominence, and and that's always my concern with all of these. You know, it's like fixing electronon fractures. I don't think these are all that different in terms of just baseline hardware issues. Um, be uh, open to anybody's uh, comments, uh, folks who actually fix a good number of these. I'll make a quick comment, uh, Bryce. Uh, interesting topic, good choice. Um, 
what we've learned over the course of the past few years is that outcomes for patella fractures are not as good as we thought. Um, and, uh, and this really highlights it well. It's a good incorporation of literature. Um, not, not a good question, but I can tell you that if I could go back in time and find the person that told the world that fractures heal in six weeks, I would eliminate that person because the patella fractures, the patients are miserable for a really long time. Um, and they actually do require a fair amount of, uh, of rehab and recovery. Hopefully some of the things that we're pushing forward with, with earlier rehabilitation for a variety of different injuries um, will help, but uh, we, we definitely need help in this zone with recovery, not, not necessarily just healing. Um, Bryce, um, great, great presentation. And, and one thing that I would appeal to the group for is obviously in some of these, you know, Humpty Dumpty cases where they're in a million pieces, you don't have much choice in the post-op rehab, you got to go slow. But I've seen so many of these people get stiff that I would, I really think one of the imperatives is to develop a construct that allows you to move them early. And uh, the nice thing about a tension band construct, just like the Electron, you know, you can actually move it and the effect of the quad on a tension band is actually to compress it to fracture. So, um, so that, that I think um, is probably one of the better constructs, whether you're using the suture, which we use more commonly now, the wire always breaks, you know, the wire is always a mess. So I think we've gotten away from wire, but some sort of a dorsal structure that allows you to compression at the fracture site with quad activation, then you can move them a little earlier because we end up scoping an awful lot of these for arthrofibrosis that um, don't get moving. So mm -hmm. obviously the tension between the non-union and the, and the arthrofibrosis, but in some ways, um, you know, I think you can accomplish both if you just watch them carefully. Bryce and Steve Sims, a, a great, great review and a great talk. I, I agree. I think when, when you see any fracture that has this many treatment options um, and you keep seeing more and more new things come along, it usually means because we haven't solved the problem yet. And, uh, and it's a, it still is a very difficult problem. It's a very subcutaneous bone. It sees a lot of stress and a lot of force across it. And long-term patellofemoral problems are certainly a, a, a problem. Uh, that that persists. So we we, ha we certainly have not solved this problem yet. But I, I agree with Dr. Mormon that, that uh, I, I think for most people the, the concern is when they're bending their knee and and weight bearing. You know where they see a lot of a lot of force across the knee and, and pulling it apart. So I think a lot of people will allow really allow them to walk on it. Uh, maybe have them an extension when they walk, but then take the braces off or or have some drop lock hinges or something that allow them to move it uh, very early because the, just, just the range of motion should not be enough to pull this apart or to cause a problem. But, uh, but walking on it or rising from a squatted position or squatting with the, the forces across can certainly it can be problematic. Uh, I've also had the very humbling experience of having several of these patients that uh, were arth had an arthroscopy after you do your fixation and you think you've got it perfect and you look at the articular surface underneath and it didn't look as perfect as you thought it was. So I've had several times we've revised it at the same operation while they had the arthroscope in. So I've often wondered if arthroscopic assisted for some of these simple fractures wouldn't be the way to go uh, to, get, to really get them lined up well. But interesting review and thanks for that topic. For the residents, I think that uh, Dr. Shu's comment was uh, very uh, appropriate and 100% agree with. You know, one of the things that that we learn from just patient um, satisfaction studies is that appropriate expectations will guide patient satisfaction. You know, quite a bit. So I think it is very reasonable when you encounter one of these to just give people a heads up that this is a year long um, recovery to get back to full function and probably two years before you hit MMI. Um, and MMI might not be their pre-morbid condition. You know, you can give an example of a football player with an extensive mechanism injury, they're out for a year. So I think that, um, that maybe, you know, doing a good job of, of giving patients appropriate expectations is really important. So I uh, certainly agree with Dr. Shu's comments here but uh, thanks to everybody this morning for uh, participating and uh, two great talks um, we will uh, look forward to seeing everybody virtually again uh, hopefully just one more time next week i believe we have m and m um, unless i missed a, uh, a calendar switch but uh, we'll see everybody next week for conference have a good day <laughs>